All right. So hey, why don't we start with a quick introduction uh, to Altrix. Sure. Hey, everyone. I'm George Matthew. I'm president of Altrix. Altrix has been in the analytics space for a few years, largely helping end users do better data prep, blending, modeling, and consumption. And it's something that we felt was more of an experience that should be handled by line of business users in a more seamless way than what was frankly out there. So we have a very good drag and drop analytic design time just to be able to build data pipelines, be able to create predictive statistical algorithmic models, and make it consumable for a broader set of users. So this has been a great journey for us. We've had almost a thousand customers today, hundreds of thousands of users, largely taking advantage of a end user driven experience like Altrix is today. Very cool. So, I mean, you guys recently made a significant change in the architecture, uh, investing heavily in Spark, you know, uh, or putting a lot of resources towards uh, the development of Spark R and helping Spark R um, get into the Spark and kind of uh, production level. So talk about the motivation behind that. What went into that thinking? Yeah, you know, startups are a funny thing there, Arslan, because you're always lurching between this, you know, moment of sort of sheer success and failure, right? <laughs> and you have to, like, just figure out how to navigate this. And for us, we felt like there was a need to expand the capabilities of what Altrix did from a prep and blending standpoint, which we felt were largely features, yeah. in an overall platform to start to introduce predictive statistical algorithmic modeling capabilities. And so the natural step forward for us to do that was to embrace R. Yeah. And so we made an embrace around R and being able to package R-based functions about two and a half, three years ago. Mm -hmm. When we shipped the product with R-based capabilities, what was really interesting was the models were like really good high fidelity models, but then when you started to see the execution and the scale out you know, occur, particularly around a variety of sources reaching petabyte scale, yeah. you literally saw like R blow up when it ran out of memory. And so that was just this moment of sheer yeah. terror you run into where it's like, okay, you have this capability that you've introduced to your customers and it's not working yeah. the way you'd expect. So we actually went down this path where we started to work with um, Revolution Analytics. They did an amazing job in terms of being able to scale out R. And the challenge that we ran into, with, and Revo ran into as well, was that what Mike talked about earlier today, that effectively Hadoop, and specifically MapReduce, was not really meant for general purpose compute and general yeah. purpose scale. And to graft an R engine, and anyone who's kind of played with RMR, like R MapReduce, will actually get exactly what I'm talking about. To graft an R engine into uh, the MapReduce world it was just non-trivial. And yeah. it just was brittle and it wouldn't scale. And really, this is where Jan and I started to talk about two years ago. He really started to introduce the idea that Databricks and the focus, particularly for the Spark team and the community, was really to introduce a world-class Spark SQL engine, a SQL optimizer on Spark. And we felt, look, if there's a SQL optimizer that can be built in such a rapid time frame, why couldn't we graft R particularly into oh. Spark very seamlessly? And we really co-committed on that about a year ago, and now we're here with the release of 1.4, where now with Spark 1.4, Spark R is a first-class citizen of Spark. Great. So as you went through this journey, I'm just curious, what was the most surprising thing for you about Spark and you know, developing on top of Spark? I think for us, like the speed and change of how the community has evolved has been just breathtaking. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you look at, I was just looking this morning, the number of active committers on Hadoop today, 41. The number of active committers on Spark, 181. Yeah. Right? And so to see this sort of platform emerge in the last two to three years, that frankly was a labor of love for a few people inside of you know, the Berkeley uh, Amp Labs community yeah. to now embrace this sort of scale that we're seeing 2,000 people in this audience today is just absolutely breathtaking. And for us, we know that we can rely on Databricks, the Amp Lab, the broader Spark community, particularly in terms of not only the evolution of the work that we've been in, very involved with with Spark R, but just the data frame API, being able to have a seamless interchange format between how something gets munged in, say yeah. for instance, a new SQL optimizer like Spark SQL, and then be introduced for algorithmic scale out in you know, what we're moving forward with, not only Spark R, but then the wrappering of uh, MLlib as well as Spark ML moving forward. Got it. So I mean, you've mentioned already a little bit of uh, Spark and Hadoop, so I'm curious. You hear Everybody loves narratives. We've heard multiple ones. We've heard Hadoop has expanded so much that it includes Spark. There is that Spark is replacing Hadoop. There's yeah. that Spark is complementary to Hadoop and so forth and works with it. So 
You've always been one for strong opinions. I'm just curious, where do you come down on this? Well, there was a lot of happy talk from all the folks that came in prior to, you know, particularly the, the distro vendors on the Hadoop side. Many of them are very, very strong partners of ours to date. But I think one of the things that people haven't asked the, the fundamental question is, yes, it's very well understood that Hadoop needs Spark, but the inverse of that question, does Spark really need Hadoop? is something which is still very, very unspoken in this room. And I think in the reality of how things are going to emerge over time, and you saw it with what Ben talked about in his walk on, where you look at this sort of platform that's emerged, particularly around Mesos, particularly around yeah. Tachyon and Spark, and there's a real fundamental question of, you know, what does this next generation of analytic compute mean, and how much does Hadoop play in it? I see. So I guess I, but I guess uh, I would much rather be you guys at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess a, a follow up to that though is that then where do you see you guys are obviously mentioning you know data blending and data prep and so forth. So where's a lot of the data sitting that you guys are working with? Is yeah, it I mean what's what's really interesting for us is that of our you know large scale enterprise customers, you know the Nikes, the WalMarts, the Goldman Sachs of the world, most of them most predominantly have their data largely sitting behind the firewall, mm -hmm. largely on premise. Yeah. And I think this is where we're seeing a dramatic shift. I think you guys made a great bet to assume that you know, the growth of data and the growth of the cloud are going to largely happen one and the same. Yeah. And I think over time, you're gonna see more of those workloads move into public cloud infrastructure. We made a big investment. You guys made a big investment in the cloud. We have um, the gallery infrastructure for Altrix, which has about 30,000 users and is growing about 4,000 users a month now. And that's been very beneficial. But still, people are testing and playing with things yeah. in the cloud to date when it comes to large-scale data infrastructure. And they're still invariably putting it on premise as we're seeing it. Yeah. But I don't think that's a question of when people are, or if people are going to move into public cloud infrastructure, it's more of a question of when, and certainly we see that occurring in the next half a decade. Okay. Um, so now that you've looked at Spark, and you've obviously, you guys have rolled up your sleeves, you've gotten into the covers and so forth, um, where do you see Spark needing to go in the next, uh, you know, one or two years, uh, so forth, to continue to adopt, continue well, to grow? Well, what's been proven is that Spark is truly a general purpose compute environment, particularly for analytics. Yeah. And I think that that journey is not one that's anywhere near complete, right? So if you look at even just the work that we went through and worked with the Databricks team on, okay, better SQL optimizers certainly in place, the introduction of are as a first class citizen of the overall Spark DAG. I think the next big thing is just how do we take some of the you know, functions, particularly from a machine learning standpoint, yeah. and start to really make them high fidelity. I mean, like, you know, as we're working with you guys on it, like, you know, we look at things from a statistics and, you know, just a algorithmic standpoint. You guys look at, you know, things mostly from a computational science standpoint. And so little things like, okay, you know, having statistical summaries available for any computational function in MLlib isn't quite there, right? The pipeline between how you would take data frames APIs and connect them up isn't quite there. But I think the speed at which the innovation is occurring, I don't worry about those things anymore. Yeah. Right? I, I know that in the next year, we'll be able to go through that journey together and make a better analytical platform emerge yeah. as it's certainly occurred in the last two. Got it. Um, so, you know, one of the, I mean, obviously Spark continues to develop and enhance, but uh, one of the things that you start seeing at this point in uh, an engine or a platform's evolution is what starts happening to the ecosystem, the things people are building on top. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what are some of the trends that you've seen uh, going on in the ecosystem? What is some of the uh, advice and input you'd have yeah. in, for people building so, the So I would say for anyone who's thinking about Spark today, the most important thing about Spark is that it's less so this sort of environment that you know there's a lot of amazing people that are doing great data engineering work, great data science work, but largely it's going to become a more invisible platform for applications to be built. Yeah. So I think the future of Spark is much more going to be about the amazing apps that are going to be natively platformed yeah. directly on top of Spark. And I think that's where Hadoop actually never got there, right? I mean, how many great applications are sitting on top of Hadoop? Yeah. I mean, literally asymptotically approaching zero. Um, but I think at the same time, you see this new community of you know, 
developers largely take on Spark as the underlying platform for building great applications. And if you look at the next four or five years, that's what I would bet on. So, okay, okay. I think we're out of time. Always but a pleasure. George, always fun. Thank you so, again, Narslan. Thank you, George. Yep. Okay.